Iran has separate problems. The immediate problem is to free Iranian society from the harsh, cruel, repressive, clerical stranglehold of the clerical regime. That's what the Rimen Freedom Life Movement is about. Till that's achieved, till minimal rights are achieved for participation in a society, the broader questions of capitalism, colonialism, cannot be seriously confronted because the population has no means of engagement. Salam, John Professor Chomsky. Mamnun in forsat o dar ekhtiyar ma qarar dadin va dar in goftoguha ba mozu ayande Iran. افتخار میزبانی شما نصیب ما شد مطلع هستید که چند ماهی مسئله جنبش زن زندگی آزادی در ایران مسئله پر رنگی شده و به واسطه اون گفتگوها در مورد آینده ایران به یکی از گفتگوهای مهم و اساسی در جامعه نخبگانی ایران تبدیل شده خب ما از انقلاب سال 57 در شاید هسته اصلی سیاست در ایران مفاهیمی از جنس زدیکت با استکبار یا امپریالیز و همینطور مخالفت با سرمایه داری به عنوان مفاهیم مهم در نظر گرفته شدن برخی معتقدند که این نوع مفاهیم کمک کرده به حکمیت و دولت تا مفاهیمی از جنس دموکراسی آزادی و حقوق بشر رو بتونه به هاشیه ببره گاهی اوقات این به هاشیه روندن از طریق انتصاب اونا به فرهنگ غربی فرهنگ سرمایداری و مواردی از این دست بوده خب به همین دلیل برخی معتقدن که جنبش زن زندگی آزادی در واقع پاسخیه به این این نوع سیاست ورزی در چار پنج دهه اخیر در ایران و به نوعی داره تلاش میکنه دموکراسی برابری حقوق و آزادی رو از حاکمیت طلب بکنه و اون رو به مرکز سیاست برگردونه در این شرایط به نظر میرسه در گروه های مختلف در جامعه ایران یه نوع دوگانگی شکل گرفته یعنی جامعه ایران پس از این چهار دهه خودش مواجه با یه دوگانه میبینه از یه طرف مقابله با امپریالیز و سرمایداری و از یه طرف تلاش برای برابری و حقوق بشر شما این دوگانه رو چطور می‌بینید؟ You might pay attention to what they actually are because the issues of capitalism, exploitation uh, are right at the heart of the crisis of the western societies today. And they will be for Iran if Iran can free itself from the cruel clerical dictatorship. Uh, Iran has an immediate problem of the women life freedom problem. Minimal conditions have to be established for uh, participation, open participation in a free participatory society. before these other questions can arise. If Iran is uh, looking to the West for some kind of model to achieve, the first thing it should do is find out what's been happening in the West since 1979. Tremendous events happened in Iran. The Iraq war, slaughter of hundreds of thousands of people, chemical weapons, brutal sanctions, uh, harsh, uh, repressive clerical regime imposed. Uh, all of that's been happening and uh, cutting off, uh, cutting Iran off by imperial power from uh, the rest of the world. Same time, things have been happening in the West. Uh, the West has been subjected the Western democracies, to 45 years of harsh class war called neoliberalism, policies that have been designed to transfer wealth to a tiny section of the population, uh, while the rest of the population, the overwhelming majority, moves to precarious, uncertain, Uh, employment uh, for male workers, 
real wages are actually real wages are lower than they were in 1979. You want to get an estimate of what it's like. Uh, the highly prestigious uh, quasi-governmental Rand Corporation just did a study of uh, transfer of wealth in the last 40 years from the lower 90% of the population to the top 1%. Now, their estimate is about $50 trillion. That's a very effective class war. At the same time, policies have been designed to deindustrialize Western countries, United States, uh, vast areas which used to have industrial production have collapsed. Now, this has left uh, similar things have happened in Britain and to a certain extent in Europe. Europe is now in fact facing deindustrialization as a result of the uh, policies of confronting Russia. Uh, this has left societies which are where there's tremendous anger, resentment, uh, chaotic cultural situation, uh, fertile terrain for demagogues. Uh, this is not a model that Iran wants to emulate. Iran has separate problems. The immediate problem is to free Iranian society from the harsh, cruel, repressive, clerical stranglehold of the clerical regime. That's what the Rimen Freedom Life Movement is about. Till that's achieved, till minimal rights are achieved for participation in a society, the broader questions of capitalism, colonialism, cannot be seriously confronted because the population has no means of engagement. Uh, there are some steps forward in this regard. The Chinese intervention to lead to a Saudi-Iranian accommodation of some kind could be a substantial relief could mean that some of the external constraints on uh, Iranian society and its development might be somewhat limit, lifted, which might offer an opportunity for internal forces to have more range and freedom to achieve the basic freedoms that are essential for a society to move forward. Iran has many possibilities as compared, say, with Saudi Arabia, that women have problems in Iran, but nothing like in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you, you don't have women mathematicians in Saudi Arabia winning international prizes. Uh, you don't have the majority of students in advanced universities being women in Saudi Arabia. You can't get a taxi cab in Saudi Arabia driven by a woman. There's enormous problems in Iran. Saudi Arabia in many ways is even more repressive. Uh, but now the two societies, if they can begin to accommodate, to extract themselves from external control, may have an opportunity to move towards a Middle East that is more free and independent. I should mention that aside from all the topics we're talking about, there is an immense irremediable problem that may make all of this completely moot. That's simply boiling of the environment. Uh, take a look at the Eastern Mediterranean region, the region of the so-called MENA countries, Middle East, North Africa, including Iran. This, is, this region is heating about twice as fast as the rest of the world. The latest projections just a few weeks ago by mainly Israeli scientists and international scientists are that the Eastern Mediterranean 
uh, the sea level will rise by one meter within the next 30 years and by two to two and a half meters by the end of the century. Take a look at the settlements. This will also affect the Persian Gulf. Much of the countries will be unviable. Uh, that's not far away. And this is the center of the oil production, which is producing the catastrophe that along with the United States, which now is under shale production, is the leading producer of fossil, the fossil fuels that are destroying the environment. So th there's a background issue which cannot be forgotten. It's going to destroy everything in the region unless this is quickly taken care of. That means that the societies of the Middle East, and that includes Iran and Saudi Arabia in particular, right at their border is the main uh, oil producing, petroleum producing region in the world. They're going to have to both move quickly and expeditiously to eliminate the use of fossil fuels. If they don't, there's no future for the whole region, in fact, for the world. Uh, that is a problem that can't be ignored. Uh, how to do this is by no means easy, but that has to be a prime concern of uh, development, uh, ch social change, economic change for all the countries in the region. Well, that's on top of the desperate need to achieve elementary human rights, to eliminate the sanctions regime, brutal, savage sanctions regime, which is destroying the Iranian economy, moving towards a multipolar international system in which it won't be uh, simply dominated by overwhelming U.S. Uh, hegemony ability to uh, impose harsh sanctions to attack countries that get out of line. Uh, all of these things have to be unraveled at many levels, and it has to be done quickly. There isn't much time. It's, uh, there's immediate problems that you face in Iran of direct repression and violence, but they're in the context of far broader problems that have to be part of the conversation and thinking as to how to reconstruct radically the societies of the region so that they can serve even so that they can survive so that these immediate problems can be addressed uh, all of the uh, there are problems of uh, uh, problems of repression of ethnic minorities the kurds in iran uh, the baluchis uh, all of these problems converge it's a mass of problems of uh, that in interrelate in many fashions. At the core of them is moving Iran towards creating a social order in which the population can freely engage and participate. یکی دیگه از پیچیدگی هایی که ما در ایران دچارش هستیم اینه که یه بخشی از مردم بعد از این جنبش زن زندگی آزادی به این نتیجه رسیدن که با توجه به تجربه چار پنج دهه اخیر گفتگو با حاکمیت از طرق مختلف اساسا حاکمیت حاضر به مصالحه در هیچ کدوم از موارد اختلافی خودش با مردم نیست و به عبارتی این نتیجه گیری شده برای بخشی از جمعیت در ایران که چاره ای جز یک نوع خشونت معتبر برای به عقب روندن حاکمیت و اساسا تغییرات رادیکال سیاسی در ایران وجود نداره و هر نوع راحل مدنی اجتماعی از جنس مشارکت های مدنی قانونی در همین ساختار فعلی اساسا نمیتونه کمک کننده باشه برای حل مشکلات خب این یک جریانه که خب اخیرا خیلی پررنگ شده از طرف دیگه در اکسال عمل به این جریان شاید یه بخشی از جامعه ایران 
با توجه به شرایط بین المللی و مخالفان و دشمنانی که ایران تو منطقه و در عرصه جهانی داره از جمله اسرائیل و کشورهای دیگه معتقدن که هر نوع تضعیف دولت و حاکمیت سبب خواهد شد که ما از طرق این کشورها مداخله نظامی داشته باشیم و شرایط ما بسیار بدتر بشه این گروه خب معتقدن که ما باید تلاش بکنیم به لحاظ نظامی به لحاظ اقتصادی حاکمیت قدرتمند شه با عبور از این مرحله و این اولویت ها بتونیم سراغ اولویت های دیگه مثل دموکراسی و حقوق بشر بریم و عرض کردم استدلالشون هم اینه که در غیر این صورت دشمنی های بین المللی اساسا دولت ملت رو در ایران نابود میکنه حالا در این دوگانه من میخوام نظر شما رو بدونم که به نظر شما چجوری باید مردم ایران اولویت گذاری بکنن دموکراسی و حقوق بشر و مقابله با حاکمیت رو اولویت بذارن البته با این جریان جدید که یه مقدارم علاقه مند به خشونت معتبر هست یا به سراغ دولت مقتدر برای مقابله با تهدیدات بین و مللی برن There's no primary and secondary All of these problems have to be addressed uh, Non-violent measures inside Iran have not of course, succeeded in overthrowing the brutal clerical regime. That's not an argument for moving to violent methods, which would be even worse. You move to the arena of violence, the advantage is on the part of those who have the comparative advantage in violence. That's not the general population. So what Uh, harsh repressive systems delight in is moving confrontation to the level of violence. That's where their strength is. Their weakness is in areas of nonviolence. Those are the uh, directions in which popular movements much must move, not only in Iran, but in everywhere else. You don't just From a simple tactical point of view, you don't move towards tactics in which the enemy has overwhelming power. Rather, you move towards tactics in which the enemy is weak, and that's popular mobilization, nonviolent activities, which uh, you can't just call on guns to repress it. Now, there are opportunities. So with the Chinese intervention to bring about some kind of accommodation between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the two major countries of the region, that offers openings that can be pursued. Uh, for one thing, one move that can be made, you mentioned Israel and its threat to attack. One way to, un and it's true, Israel's moving far to the right it's now the united states are debt and israel are both desperate about the accommodation between china saudi arabia and iran that breaks up a regional system of control which goes back to the second world war whole period the basis of power in the region has been a u.s saudi Israeli alliance is now breaking up with China moving in. And it's not just Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, other major power in the region, is a focus of the uh, maritime Silk Road. China, remember, has two major development problems, uh, projects moving through Eurasia. One is the Belt and Road Initiative, so-called New Silk Road, integrating much of Eurasia into the Chinese-dominated uh, development and investment system. The other is the Maritime Silk Road, which runs through the oceans along the border of southern Eurasia, It reaches into the into the Gulf. And the focal point of it is the United Arab Emirates. That's been a, a, 
a centerpiece for the Chinese expansion program. Now Saudi Arabia is joining in. Uh, in fact, in an odd way, even Israel is. China owns about half the port of Haifa, the main port, uh, where, which is a U.S. naval base. The United States doesn't like it. Well, all of these changes are taking place not just in the region. It's taking place internationally. So take the war in Ukraine. The United States has been trying very hard to get the countries of the global south to join the United States in what in fact has become a kind of proxy war between the United States and Russia over Iranian, Ukrainian bodies. The world is totally refusing. There was a major conference in Munich, Munich Strategic Conference in February, uh, where uh, U.S. representatives, Vice President Kamala Harris, other representatives, tried to bring the Global South to join the United States in confrontation with Russia. Every single country refused. India, Indonesia, African countries, even the close U.S. allies in Latin America, like Colombia, Brazil, totally refused. This is not our war. We want to move towards negotiated settlement in diplomatic settlement in Ukraine. We do not want to, we refuse to accept the sanctions. We're continuing to make other arrangements, including currency arrangements outside the dollar system whole system is breaking up. Indonesia and uh, India are major countries. Uh, they're not, uh, can't be simply ignored any more than Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates can be. Well, it's fragmenting. That offers serious opportunities for Iran. Iran it has joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but it can move towards overcoming what has been a critical problem for Iran, the threat of nuclear, of, a, of a military attack. Notice what that's based on. It's based on the alleged threat of Iran to develop nuclear weapons. Very simple answer to overcoming that problem. It's well known, but it's not discussed. Can't talk about it in the West. Very simple answer, nuclear weapons free zone in the region. Impose a nuclear weapons free zone in the region with uh, extensive inspections. We know that they work. They worked very well during the JCPOA period, the years, a couple of years before the United States dismantled the uh, nuclear arrangement. Even U.S. intelligence agrees that inspections were working very effectively. Can work. Nuclear weapons free zone. Any threat of programs would pull the rug under the attempts of Israel and the United States to threaten Iran with sabotage, assassinations military attack, and so on. It's been right on the verge of implementation for 30 years. The Arab states are strongly in favor of it. Global South is overwhelmingly in favor of it. G77, 130 countries of the Global South, strongly advocated. Iran has pretty much supported it. Not as strongly as it could, but has given at least tacit support. Europe is in favor of it. It's vetoed by the United States at every international uh, meeting, most recently by President Obama in 2015, subsequent meetings. And the reason is very simple. The United States does not want Israeli nuclear weapons to be open for inspection. Uh, 
In fact, the United States does not even formally concede that Israel has nuclear weapons. Can't do that because that would bring in American law, which would make U.S. aid to Israel illegal under U.S. law. And neither political party in the United States has been willing to open that door. But things are changing. You take a look at polls in the United States on Israel and Palestinians. There's been a radical change. Hasn't affected policy yet. But in a relatively democratic society like the United States, popular opinion can't be ignored forever. Take a look at the younger population, high school and college students called Generation Z. They're split 50-50 on support for Palestinians and Israelis. Sharply different from what happened before. And it's increasing. Take a look at the party support. Among Democrats, large majority support Palestinians more than Israel. Support for Israel used to be based in liberal, democratic uh, American society. It's changed overwhelmingly. Now the support is based in the evangelical community, which is similar to the ultra-religious elements in Iran and Saudi Arabia, in the military and security systems, which have very intimate relations with Israel, very close, uh, and uh, ultra-nationalist ultra right. That's a huge change. It's very unstable. It means that the whole complexion of American policy towards the Middle East might be facing a substantial change. The Chinese intervention to move towards some kind of Iranian Saudi accommodation is another force could move in the move of the United States Emirates to be part of the Chinese-based Maritime Silk Road is another. The breakaway of the Global South, India, Indonesia, Colombia, Brazil, BRICS countries from the US-dominated system is another force. All of these forces are in operation, gives, I think, the immediate, desperate, serious problems in Iran of overcoming vicious, savage repression have to be conceived, perceived within this broader framework in which, which is going to have major effects on the conditions under which the Iranian can be conducted. And again, I will say once more that unless the fossil fuel system is quickly brought to it's all moot, nothing's going to happen. شما در مورد مصالحه ایران با عربستان از طریق وساطت چین طرح بحث فرمودید و نقشی که این میتونه تو بهبود روابط ایران با جهان داشته باشه یکی از نکاتی که وجود داره و خیلی از متفکرین و منتقدین تو ایران طرحش میکنن اینه که ما این مصالحه با عربستان رو با وساطت چین باید به نوعی وابسته به تلقی سیاستمداران ایرانی در مورد آینده جهان و به قولی نظم جدیدی که از اون صحبت میکنن وابسته بدونیم نظمی که بنابر نظر اونها با قدرت گرفتن آسیا بالخصوص چین و تضعیف آمریکا شکل پیدا میکنه خب این ذهنیت که شاید توی چندین سال اخیر خیلی قوت هم پیدا کرده خیلی در موردش گفت و گو میشه به شکلی داره سازماندهی میکنه تصمیماتی که در حوزه سیاست خارجی توسط ایران گرفته میشه و مسئولین ایرانی گرفته میشه به نظر شما چنین پیش بینی در مورد آینده در مورد قدرت گرفتن چین تضعیف آمریکا چقدر پیش بینی قابل اتکایی و سرمایه گذاری کردن و برنامه ریزی کردن بر اساس این پیش بینی توسط مسئول ایرانی چقدر میتونه تصمیم 
درستی باشه و رفتن در این مسیر با تمام نتایجی که داره چقدر میتونه به روابط ایران و کشورهای جهان کمک بکنه First of all, we should be clear about the development of global society. There is a lot of talk about the decline of the United States uh, and the rise of China. This has been going on for 30 years. Uh, hasn't happened. The United States' overwhelming power remains. You can see it. China is indeed developing with investment, lending, development programs throughout Eurasia, uh, reaching as far as Iran, as far as Turkey, maybe even as far as Hungary, where China's setting up a major battery program into Africa, into uh, South Asia, uh, even into Latin America, where China's a uh, larger uh, trade partner than the United States is right in the U.S. backyard. But that's only part of the story, one part. The other part of the story is that U.S. hegemony is in fact overwhelming. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how China economically is reaching a point where it may approach U.S. economic power. It's very misleading. If you take a look, there's been a tendency in, among international economists to measure the economic power of a country by its gross domestic product, the economy of the country. Highly misleading in a globalized world. Uh, if you look at another measure, there's another measure. Who owns the wealth of the world? Which multinational corporations own the wealth of the world? It turns out that about 50% of world wealth is owned by multinationals based in the United States. That's a different measure of economic power. If you have somebody has a, an iPhone, let's say, it's assembled in China, but the profits go to Apple. They go to partly to Foxconn, those Taiwanese, uh, uh, a huge ta Taiwanese conglomerate that organizes the production. But the basic profits go back to Apple Corporation, which has the patents, the design, uh, the so-called rent from an economic point of view. That's economically. Take a look militarily. There's no comparison. The United States outspends the next 10 countries combined. Uh, nobody's even close. Far more advanced technologically, moving into space system control systems. Uh, like, take a look at the geopolitics of the United NATO seemed to be tottering before the Ukraine war. Uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine was an enormous gift to the United States, enormous gift in many respects. Uh, first of all, uh, just militarily, at a small fraction of the colossal military budget, the United States is able to seriously degrade and undermine the military forces of its main military opponent. That's a bargain. There's plenty of gloating about it in the United States. On top of that, uh, Russia is being economically harmed. Ukraine is being devastated. Europe is moving towards a kind of deindustrialization. Even the Economist magazine warns that Europe is moving deindustrialization as it loses its natural trading partners in the East. Remember, there's a, the German-based industrial system in Europe, which has been so successful, depends critically on minerals and resources from Russia and access to the huge Chinese market, which is a bigger market for the EU than the United States is. It's been broken by the war. 
In fact, what's happened is that Europe has been driven more into US control. US meanwhile is profiting enormously. Uh, instead of cheap gas from Russia, Germany has to get very expensive liquefied natural gas from the United States. Enormous profits for the energy corporations. They've never had such profitable years. Include Saudi Arabia, incidentally, biggest profits ever. The United States is just doing wonderfully from the war. The rest of the world is suffering. NATO has not only, not only has have the European countries more uh, sub, sub, subjected themselves more solely, solely more uh, significantly to NATO, meaning U.S. control, but NATO itself has expanded to a global system. The last NATO summit, February, extended NATO to the Indo-Pacific region. For the first time, U.S. Asian allies were brought into the NATO summit meeting. Japan, South Korea, uh, all of this is now part of NATO. Global system, Indo-Pacific, huge military, naval operations, RIMPAC, they're called, in the Pacific region, aimed at China, official U.S. policy, official, I'll just keep to the official terms, are to encircle China with a ring of what are called sentinel states, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Guam, Australia, military bases, New Zealand, uh, military forces aimed at China with uh, high-tech precision weapons provided by the United States. Quite apart from this, the United States under the Biden administration has declared an economic war against China, a war to try to prevent China from developing for generations by removing any access to the high quality uh, technology, semiconductors, chips that are needed for advanced industry. Now, this is a quite a complex issue. The supply chains for these systems extend all over the world. Uh, you think you have an iPhone, but the pieces of it come from everywhere when you look at it. So, now, if the United States is now trying to compel Europe, Japan, and South Korea to break their commercial relations with China, the idea is to harm China. It's going to be a very severe blow to Samsung in South Korea, to the Japanese uh, industry, to the Netherlands in Europe. Netherlands has the most advanced lithographic industry in the world, which creates crucial parts for semiconductors. They're all being instructed by the United States, you have to lose your major market. What's going to happen to them? They're going to seriously decline if they accept. If they don't accept, we have a breakup of the US dominated Western order, including the its Asian allies, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. All of this is right on the horizon. Uh, there are major developments taking place in the world. The US military, high military officials, generals, are saying we're going to have to have a war with China in a couple, two or three years. A war with China is the end of the world. Nuclear powers cannot have a war. They'll destroy everything. Impossible. It cannot be a war with major nuclear powers. But that's what they're talking about. Well, this is the world that we're facing. If you're sitting in Iran, you have immediate problems, which are very serious. Uh, but uh, poisoning girls in schools is not a small problem. But it's within the context of enormous changes in the world system, which are going to set the context in which the struggles within Iran will have to proceed. 
They're not in isolation. The world is changing radically. We don't know where it's moving. But uh, these potential conflicts are extraordinarily serious, may break up at any, may break out into major conflict at any time. I mean, that's only part of it. Take, take South Asia. Pakistan is barely surviving under radical climate change. A third of the country was underwater uh, a couple months ago, uh, hopelessly indebted. Uh, nearby in India, uh, poor peasants are living in mud huts in Rajasthan trying to survive a heat of approaching 50 degrees centigrade. Uh, Celsius, uh, unlivable, of course, no air conditioning, not even 10% of the population in India has air conditioning, that's only the very rich. Uh, these are the glaciers in the Himalayas, which are the water source for both Pakistan and India are melting. These are two nuclear armed powers. They're in desperate conditions locally, but they're nuclear armed. They're going to be confronting a question of who's going to control the head that, that uh, provide the basic resources for the survival. Areas that are going to be unlivable unless something's done seriously. It's not very far from Iran. Uh, well, can't overlook these problems. The problems of Iran themselves are very serious, but within a context of developing problems throughout the world, which are going to determine whether organized human society can even survive very long. Because Bahasai ke matrah kardin dar khusus salah hastei bud. الان در جامعه با توجه به بحث‌ها و نظرات مختلفی که وجود داره در خصوص سطوح قنیسازی اورانیوم توسط ایران برخی دارن این ایده رو مطرح میکنن که شاید ایران به سمت قنیسازی بالای 95 درصد بره و علاقمند باشه که یه تست سلاح هسته‌ای انجام بده تا این نظمی که بر علیه شکل گرفته توسط کشورهای غربی رو معکوس بکنه و یه جوری نشون بده که من توی این بازی برنده هستم و از این طریق قدرت خودش رو اثبات کنه نظر شما چیه؟ به نظر شما همچین پیشبینی پیشبینی دقیقی هست یا نه و در صورت رخ دادن همچین اتفاقی ما چه پیشبینی در مورد آینده ایران میتونیم داشته باشیم؟ Well, I'm not Of course, I know nothing about the internal thinking of the uh, clerical guardian council who's making policy, but if they are planning to develop a nuclear weapon, which I rather doubt, but if they are, for Iran, that's suicidal. Iran can do nothing with a nuclear weapon. If Iran even began to prepare to mount a weapon on a missile, the country would be destroyed. Uh, I mean, the United States and Israel are just almost salivating with glee, hoping for that opportunity. Well, that would give an opportunity to the United States to carry out a major attack against Iran if it began to uh, even think about using nuclear weapons. So that if they're thinking rationally in planning circles, they will not be planning to develop a nuclear weapon. It's not a deterrent for anything. It's just an open call for being destroyed. And it doesn't have to be bombing. It can be by missiles, uh, all sorts of ways to destroy a country. Uh, which has no defenses. So what Iran ought to be doing is pressing hard to try to move to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the entire region. That, again, if you're, ta if you're thinking tactically, 
you go to your enemy's weak spot, not its strong spot. The strong spot of the United States and Israel is means of violence. That's where they're overwhelmingly powerful. Their weak spot is popular concerns for decent survival. Now, the almost the entire world is for 30 years has been supporting a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. The United States and Israel are blocking it. In the United States, you cannot even discuss it, literally, because it's too dangerous. If this becomes a topic of public discussion, the whole system of control erodes and collapses because it's such an obvious, simple solution to whatever the problem is supposed to be about Iranian nuclear programs. That's what you should be pressing. Your enemy's weak point, not their strong point. Just as in the internal tactics, similarly in the international thinking, the move towards a comp some sort of accommodation with Saudi Arabia offers new opportunities. Saudi Arabia doesn't want to be destroyed by nuclear weapons. Uh, it's an awful country in many ways. It's idle. Uh, here's a way to stop the development of nuclear weapons in both countries. If Iran were to move towards nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia would as well. Israel, of course, has an overwhelming nuclear uh, You want to stop that right away by moving towards the obvious solution, which is blocked only by US and Israeli opposition. Powerful in military force, not in political force. That's, you might take a uh, lesson from the Vietnamese resistance to the United States was well understood in the early 1960s, including by US intelligence, that the United States was fighting a military war in South Vietnam, and the Vietnamese were fighting a political war, not a military war. Of course, they defended themselves, but they were fighting a political war on the ground that led to such events as the so-called Tet Offensive, most incredible popular uprising in human history, uh, which made it clear to US military they cannot win this war, they began to pull out. Well, there are lessons there. Uh, you move towards where your opponent is weak, not towards where they're strong. And the weakness of the United States and Israel is the moves of the countries of the region and the world to try to end the threat of nuclear war by imposing a nuclear weapon in the region. I should mention it's not only the Middle East. Take Africa. Africa has a nuclear weapons free zone. It cannot be implemented. Why? because of Britain and the United States, which prevent its implementation. Again, not very far from Iran. The island of Diego Garcia is part of Africa. The United Nations has determined that. International Court of Justice has determined it. The United States refuses. Britain follows orders from the United States. So Britain holds on to it expelled the population so the United States can construct a major military base there, which was upgraded by Obama to a nuclear base. And it's the base that is used all the time for bombing Central Asia and the Middle East. Well, you can't implement the African uh, Middle East uh, nuclear weapons free zone. What about the Pacific? Pacific has a nuclear weapons free zone. Can't be implemented because the United States insists on maintaining nuclear weapons facilities on its Pacific Island dependencies. 
This is happening all over the world. The Middle East, nuclear weapons free zone in many ways is the most important. Well, all of these are areas where world opinion is overwhelmingly in favor of eliminating the threat of nuclear destruction by means that are very feasible. It's blocked by the United States, by Israel, by Britain, which is now virtually a satellite of the United States. And thanks to Putin's war, driving uh, Europe into the hands of the United States, a very unstable situation. Uh, China's exploiting it in its own way by uh, economic and diplomatic moves. The United States is trying to use its comparative advantage violence to bring about a, to maintain uh, the unipolar US hegemony of the post-war period. Well, Iran has to find its place within this complex. That's the world situation that's developing. یکی دیگه از سوالاتی که مطرح هستش اینه که در حال حاضر حاکمیت و نظام سیاسی خیلی قدرت خودش رو وابسته به بخشای از جامعه که طبقات مذهبی جامعه هستن قلم داد میکنه که البته بخشای بسیار قدرتمند و مستحکمی هستن خب وقتی ما صحبت از حرکت جامعه به سمت یک سیاست دموکراتیک و بر مبنای حقوق بشر میکنیم طبیعتا باید صحبت بکنیم از اینکه چه تغییرات فرهنگی تو بخش های مختلف جامعه بلخصوص تو بخش های مذهبی جامعه اتفاق افتاد من علاقه مندم دیدگاه شما رو در مورد نقش اسلام در جامعه ایران و تغییراتی که لازم هست شکل بگیره در این جامعه و نوع تفکراتش و روش این تغییرات بدونم Two points. First of all, it can't be brought about by force. It's got to be brought about by the willingness of the deeply religious, largely rural Islamic population to join in a more growing, developing uh, society. And that can happen. Second point, it's not specific to Iran. It's all over the world. Take a look at Israel. Israel is now the religious nationalist elements in Israel have now taken over the government. It's not Iran, but it's moving in that direction. Uh, there's a huge protest in Israel of secular protests. It's pretty serious. It's gotten to the point where the Israeli Air Force, their major weapon of domination, is being threatened because officers are refusing to serve. There's a revolt of officers in the Air Force refusing to serve. Uh, for a very simple reason. If Israel becomes a theocratic state without a at least facade of democratic, secular functioning. Uh, Israeli military becomes subject to international sanctions. If Israel bombs, uh, uh, carries out military actions which destroy Palestinian homes, uh, bomb people in Syria and so on, they can be brought to the International Criminal Court. The facade that prevents this is we have a domestic uh, judicial system. Eliminate that, you're in trouble. That's Israel. It's moving under the control of ultra-religious uh, segments which don't even care if the country is destroyed because they have God on their side, literally. Take a look at the United States. The Republican Party, which is very likely, to, which already has substantial power, may take more power, its popular base is an extremist, 
evangelical Christian nationalist movement, which doesn't believe in evolution, doesn't believe in global warming, is somewhere back in the Middle Ages. That's the United States. Take a look at Brazil. Uh, you saw what happened after Lula's inauguration, major popular attack on government, on the Supreme Court, on the parliament, government facilities by organized mobs, supported by the military. It's almost half the country. A large part of it, overwhelming part, is evangelical Christians, extremist evangelical Christians. These are developments that are taking place all over the world, not just Iran. And they have to be dealt with internally by programs which will bring these populations into a willing acceptance of moving into a more modern, developing, advanced society with rights and freedom. It's not a small task. All of this has been exacerbated by the neoliberal programs of the past 40 years, which have been a major assault on the social order in all of the developed societies. Most extreme is the United States, but others as well. Uh, well, these are not trivial problems. Iran's facing them, so are others. And it should be in solidarity. The secular, democratic uh, forces in Iran that are calling for women's rights and human rights are the same ones that are trying to do the same under even harsher conditions in Saudi Arabia. And the same ones that uh, in the United States and in Western Europe are trying to reverse the move towards more autocratic uh, uh, systems with high concentration of wealth and precarious existence for everyone else, all working together. This isn't for Russia or in the same way. These are the elements of global order that have to work together in solidarity to overcome the enormous crisis that humanity faces in many dimensions. We've talked about many of them. They can all be solved. We know of ways to solving them. It's not out of control, but it has to be done and the, it's going to be spearheaded by popular forces working in solidarity together internationally to overcome the global forces of oppression and violence and terror. شما پروفسور چامسکی شما راه حلی که به لحاظ ژئوپلیتیک به عبارتی برای ایران ارائه کردین یعنی مصالحه با کشورهای مختلف توسط ایران و دعوت از اونا برای ساختن یه فریزون به لحاظ صلاح هسته‌ای در منطقه خاورمیانه خب همونطوری که گفتین خیلی راه حل سرراست و ساده ایه. ولی این مسئله از نظر مردم ایران خیلی مسئله پیچیده ایه یعنی یه نوع تناقض واره در اینجا وجود داره به این جهت که خب الان نزدیک به دو دهه هستش که مسئله غنی سازی هسته یا انرژی هسته یا هر عبارت دیگه ای تقریبا میشه گفتش که مسئله اصلی سیاست خارجی ایران تبدیل شده و مسئله تحریما و تمام مناقشاتی که در اثر تحریما در جامعه ایران شکل گرفته همه اینا ناشی از این مسئله است ما چطور میتونیم این مسئله رو یک مسئله با راه حل ساده بدونیم در حالی که انصراف حاکمیت از چنین استراتژی که در این حد از اولویت قرار داره برای دو دهه هیچ وقت راه حلی پیدا نکرده و به یه مسئله خیلی پیچیده تبدیل شده خب ما چطور هم یک راه حل ساده داشته باشیم هم یک وضعیت پیچیده و در این شرایط باید مردم ایران چطور حرکت کنند I think we know the answer the question is how to reach the answer the answer is nuclear weapons free zone in the middle east 
Now, the Iranian government in the past has indicated support for that. Iran take the international treaty for the prevention of production of nuclear weapons. Over 100 countries, 120 countries signed the treaty. It's now an operative treaty under the United Nations, which makes it, which bans the production of nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapon states refuse to join, but they can be pressed in that direction. What about Iran? Iran did not actually join, but it indicated support for it. Well, it should move forward. Government's not going to do it on its own, but the population should Iran to move towards joining the treaty, the international UN treaty for the prevention of production of nuclear weapons. Population of Iran should be pressing the government to be moving towards more active advocacy of the nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East, which the entire world supports. Arab states, Global South, G77, Europe, barred by the United States and Israel. It's a weak read. Push for that, not for enrichment of uranium, which is just a gift to the enemy. It's a gift to Israel and the United States. It gives them the pretext they want to use what their, the, uh, their own comparative advantage, violence. That's their advantage, the arena of violence. You want to move to that direction? Suicidal, of course. You can. If you're sensible, you move to the direction where you're strong. Popular support for a peaceful developing world. We know the means to develop. Join the treaty for prevention of production of nuclear weapons. Advocate strongly for a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. Make it clear that what's blocking it is Israeli nuclear weapons and U.S. support for them. Even in the United States, people wouldn't support that if they were aware of it. That's why it's kept quiet. Why well, you won't find a single article about it in the press. Of course, they know about it, but they won't write about it. It's too dangerous. Opens the doors to the public becoming involved in ways which will undermine power. These are problems which show up in every country in one way or another. Well, in Iran, you look for those weaknesses. Those are the ones you try to press, try to develop, and they're there. The Accommodation with minimal accommodation with Saudi Arabia opens some doors. Uh, the uh, uh, move towards Middle East uh, uh, nuclear weapons free zone opens doors. The pressure on the part of most of the world to draw away from the NATO based system of global confrontation that opens doors. Pursue them. Popular movements around the world have the power, if they join together, to stop this suicidal race to global destruction. Can stop it, but they're going to have to work together, solidarity, cooperation, fighting repressive, brutal systems, but with the weapons that are available to them non-violence, popular mobilization, education, uh, cultural activities, programs, concrete substantive programs that meet people's immediate needs, all of these things can be pursued. It's not simple by any means. It's not impossible. خب من آخرین مطلبی که از شما میخوام اینه که اگر جنبندی لازم هست بفرمایید و اینکه نظر خودتون رو با ما در میون بذارید که آیا شما در خصوص آینده ایران خوشبین هستین یا یک آینده بدبینانه رو برای ایران تصویر, تصویر میکنید خوشحال میشم نظرتون رو بدونم و اگر جمعندی هست با ما در میون بذارید well, with regard to optimism and pessimism 
It's a very simple response. We can either choose to be pessimistic, give up hope, help ensure that the worst will happen. That's one choice. The other choice is to grasp the opportunities that exist, and they do exist, and to pursue them as far as possible. Maybe we'll make a much better world. That's not much of a choice. خیلی تشکر میکنم از حضور شما و فرصتی که به ما اختصاص دادین و دعوت در این رویداد رو پذیرفتین. خیلی ممنونم امیدوارم که روز خوبی داشته باشید خدا نگهدار. Yeah.